don't be afraid to network and reach out and connect with people even people that you might consider um, a competitor of yours um, which is might be considered a bit of a um, different take on things but f a lot of the time especially in any kind of creative industry um, you're not really competing with each other you're often building your own bases and and your own clients and oftentimes you have a lot to gain by connecting with each other Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second season of the Commerce, Coffee, and Community Podcast, Entrepreneurs Edition. I'm your host, Brandon Greenall, and joining us for episode one is my good friend, Harry Perry of Perry Films. How's it going today, Harry? Hey, Brandon, doing pretty good. Thanks for having me on. Good to have you, man. Um, why don't we start off the interview today with uh, you just telling us a little bit about your background, Harry, where you grew up, and what made you decide to move to Prince George and, and has kind of kept you here? Uh, so, I mean, as you can tell a little bit, I'm not originally from Prince George, so I grew up in the UK, um, lived there for probably about um, 16, 17, 18 years of my life, and then um, moved to Canada about several years after the rest of my family moved here. Uh, they moved here in 2014, and I followed suit um, after I graduated university in the UK um, in 2018. And um, yeah, I've always been a big lover of of advertising and marketing and everything like that um and you know when the kind of opportunity came up to come and live in prince george it, i jumped on it pretty quick and uh, and what did you study back in uh, back in university uh, so i studied business management and marketing at cardiff university that makes uh, good sense yeah you're good good marketing guy right interested in advertising so <laughs> yeah it's actually kind of one of the big pieces of being there is what kind of made me fall in love with the marketing and advertising portion um there's so many different routes you can take when you go to marketing, whether you do digital and, and kind of add copy and everything. But for me, the kind of um, the video advertising portion was just like next level, like seeing kind of how different brands and stuff kind of used story and video and visuals and everything that goes into it to kind of create emotion to connect you to it. Like that part, I think I in those classes of my uh, um, it was like integrated marketing communication strategy, I think they called it. Um, like I think I was probably one of the few people that was really geeking out at the uh, um, the various kind of videos and examples that were shown in the lecture. So that's definitely where a huge interest started. Right. So you went to university. You you know found your passion there. And what kind of brought you? Obviously, you, you've come to Prince George. You've you started Perry Films. But what was kind of your introduction to videography? sort of as as the first experience you had getting into that industry? The first the first kind of experience I had was that when my family first moved here, like um, we would do an agriculture, right? So my family have always been farmers and things from generations back, like as far back as you can find on Ancestry in like the 1500s, the berries were farmers, like <laughs> that's it. Um, so when they first came here, they, you don't really have a name. And it's quite bizarre when you go from one location where you might be quite well known to another location where nobody knows you. And trying to build yourself up from nothing is difficult. So what we started doing was doing various kind of advertising, but everything from kind of, you know, generic ads on Kijiji and such, to then creating social media pages, website, things we'd never done before. Um, right. Usually it was all through network. Um, so then I started... Um, trying to get various photos and videos we ended up buying a drone so we could kind of show the machinery we were using and things so cool. honestly the first piece of film kit that kind of sparked from that was the um, a Mavic drone from DJI right. and uh, that's like the first part that went into it. I used to just make drone videos with like music overlaid with uh, the tractors and stuff doing their thing in the field that's awesome so you were able to kind of use this passion to you know help out the family business a little bit but obviously, you know, starting a company is is a whole different whole different ball game from uh, from you know just doing something as a as a passion project. So, what was what was kind of your initial motivation of starting Perry Films? Uh, the kind of the initial motivation was just seeing that um, there's lots of places that have like really amazing kind of either business or story or something that's kind of unique about them that people didn't really know about. Um, and it, same thing happened with with my family. So getting into video was a way of kind of getting the message out there the content that people liked engaging with um, and it kind of ended up triggering that a bit just because you're doing videos for yourself and you're putting them out there and your friends and family and such are like oh like 
we saw the video you posted or, right. or complimenting you on it. Um, and then someone else is like, Hey, would, would you do one for me? And then, um, at first it would just be a, yeah, pay me whatever it's worth right. to you. If it slumps, don't worry about it. If it does quite well, then sure, whatever it's just been worth to you. And that's honestly just kind of how it starts like rolling. It was, it's kind of interesting like that. That's cool. Yeah. So you were able to, you know, use that to, to build up a little bit of exposure um, and, you know, practice that creative element of, of videography. Um, moving forward, what is kind of the mission behind Perry Films as a company? It's always a difficult part to think of like any kind of mission statement in terms of being more formal. But I think for the most part, what Perry Films is really trying to do is using video to tell stories. Um, and that can be across promotional, um, you know, business individuals, like documentary style stuff. Um, everything that I've tried to do in anything that I make is really trying to captivate kind of a, a story here that we're trying to tell. There's always something unique about um, whatever we're filming that that people don't know. And, and my goal for that really is to make something um, better known and to ideally incite some sort of connection um, with with between people and um, the subject of the video. And, and video is just such a powerful, you know, storytelling tool, right? That, you know, businesses might not think about, for instance. So that's a really cool mission that you can take forward and, and help businesses communicate that story. Um, now, this might be the hardest question I throw at you all day here uh, because we have so many good places, but where is your favorite place to eat here in Prince George? <laughs> My favorite place to be, I think I would, like it's tough for me to think about, but I would probably go for uh, Ramen Ya up in the uh, upper part of College Heights there. Shout out to Ramen Ya. <laughs> <laughs> That's, what's your, what's your uh, recommendation for a meal for listeners here? Uh, I mean, uh, any of the ramen bowls are good. They're still doing some of the sushi, which is like peak for me. It's like some of the best, some <laughs> of the best awesome. in town. But I mean, any one of the ramen bowls really you'd go for. Good to know. Good to know. Um, Awesome. So let's let's go back in time a little bit here to the very beginning of Perry Films and the start of your entrepreneurial journey. Uh, what were some of the first steps you took in setting your business up? Uh, some of the first steps, I mean, really for me is kind of seeing if it was possible in terms of equipment and gear. Um, that was kind of probably the biggest piece for me at first. Or one of the main things you think about when you're first setting up the concept is really the um, kind of operational portion of it is like, can I get film equipment and whatever I need to do it? And what can I use and kind of what can I get away with for now sort of thing, especially when you're first starting out. Um, so that's, I'd say it's kind of, those are the sort of the first concepts I really lean on um, in terms of getting Perry Films up off the ground. Yeah, you just had to kind of build out your your proof of concept and, um, you know, every entrepreneur has to kind of gauge that financial viability as well for starting out. So uh, those are some really good first steps for listeners. Uh, now, another good first question that listeners may have uh, for entrepreneurs is how they secured, you know, their first ever gig. You're, you're stepping into, in your case, industry of, of filmography and, and creating videos that tell stories. So how were you able to kind of gain the interest of your first client? Um, I think really, and, and I think it, it splits some, it splits some opinions a little bit, um, in terms of my concept, but a uh, big thing for me is that quality is like ranges over everything. Like the better content you can make, the more heads you're going to turn or the more people are going to be interested or the more people are going to follow you on social media. But another big part of that is like sometimes when you're needing to learn and you want to kind of gain clients and you want to get a bit, bit of experience and sometimes you can't always do um, you can't always get the experience in gain clients or anything like that when you're first starting out because you don't really have that much experience. So uh, free to fee is really the, the name of the game for me. Um, you can reach out to any number of businesses, um, tourism agencies or anything like that and say, hey, I see you do this on social media or you've done this. And um, I've seen that they, you know, maybe reels or vertical videos really taking off right now. And I would love to come and make some content for you um, as part of building up my portfolio. Um, totally free to you. And it's kind of a win-win situation because I'll have better experience and another portfolio piece and you'll get some free content. Um, and honestly, it, like half the time people will be going, no, no, I'll, I'll pay you 
to to do it and 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 that's honestly been such a good way to gain like relationships and build with people and and kind of get a bit more of a foothold of kind of what the real process should be like because the more kind of people you do that with the better grasp you've got in terms of the concept of how to reach out and communicate with people but also how to build the project once it's kind of accepted and ready to go right so it gives you an opportunity to kind of put yourself out there, you know, introduce yourself in a, in an environment where, you know, business doesn't necessarily feel pressured to, um, to, you know, support you financially when you want to get to that place once you have a portfolio. Um, but it really does give you a chance to just kind of get out there and, and practice your craft a little bit. Right. Um, I feel like in, in your industry in, in particular, there's such a learning curve, right. To get into it and you want to be able to produce pieces, but, um, it's hard to do that without, you know, content and without, um, without subjects for your films and things like that. So being able to network that way and, and get some, get some subjects for your content is super beneficial. Yeah. And you have to kind of do that because it's like another part of it is it is obviously telling people like, um, how much goes into it. It really helps you to kind of build everything around it because not only do you see how much time you're spending, but then you can also say, well, hey, like this would usually cost, say, $1,200 as an example, or right. it might be $600 or whatever you're charging. Yeah. Um, but for you, it's going to be free to do this. Like there's an immediate like level of trust there that you can build with anybody from doing that just to get off the ground, which is to me super beneficial, I think, for, for anybody trying to get into the industry. Absolutely. Now you've, you've had obviously, you know, a couple of years into, into your journey as an entrepreneur um, and going from sort of those first engagements to now, what has been your favorite production that you've done so far? I would say um, my favorite production that I've done so far, I think is prob is my most recent one to date, which is the Prince George figure skating club together. We skate video um, for their submission to the national uh, skate Canada contest. That's probably my favorite one so far because I think um, huge degree of like shots that we're trying to get um, and then uh, various methods to get them and oh, like oh, it's just a lot of fun to film and then everybody at the club was just so friendly and so so happy to have you there and 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 I had basically full creative freedom to to take the video in whichever direction works best and and everybody loved the um, the final outcome so I mean it, it couldn't go better I think in terms of an overall project. So I was pretty pleased to pop that one. That's another really good angle for um, any entrepreneurs, especially in the service sector. So whether you're doing uh, website development, marketing, video, um, is to work with not-for-profits because they are, um, they really need the help for one and they don't necessarily have the budget for two um, to bring on a, a company. So if you're, if you're just starting out and looking for, um, you know, an organization to approach, maybe that's a good start as well. Yeah, I think it's 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 a massive help to a nonprofit because, like, like you say, they don't have the budget to go and hire somebody. Um, and typically, all the people that are there are volunteers, right? right? So, like, the majority of people there volunteering are all super happy, and they and like because you've helped them out and helped out a cause that's very dear to their heart, um, they're going to be like screaming and shouting your name um, to anybody that was interested in video work and such. And, and so there, there's obviously a nice, um, like benefit to both of you in terms of a, again, like portfolio building and such, but you get to work with just some really great people that just are really passionate about the cause. And, and like we kind of said at the start, in terms of telling a story, those go hand in hand. Like you end up with such a good, unique story to tell when you're focusing on those key points. And, and for us, like it doing the, um, with a skating club, like interviewing, like even from, like teens to young kids and stuff about their experiences at the club. It obviously it makes for some really fun interviews and, and and some pretty cute content too. So, so yeah, huge benefits all around. Absolutely. And you really do build, um, you know, advocates for yourself and for your, uh, your business moving forward, working with those, those partners, because like you said, they're, uh, they're just so tremendously thankful for, for the work that you put into it and the energy that you put into it. Um, from there, every entrepreneur has the, ups and down moments. Uh, so why don't you tell us the most hair puller moment of your journey so far? We'll start off with the bad and then we'll go to the good after. <laughs> I think the most hair pulling moment for me is realizing you've bought junk audio or, or like, sorry, junk audio and uh, equipment. I think when you first start, you kind of, 
you, you're looking on Amazon and everything, trying to find <laughs> stuff that's going to be the most affordable or whatever. And, and you right. sort of, you, you're jumping from YouTube review to YouTube review of, of various products and everything. Is there really a difference between this thousand dollar <laughs> mic compared yeah. to this, you know, seventy dollar mic? Um, and you try and kid yourself and that you can get away with buying cheap gear. And, and I think some of the issues that you end up coming across is just like, it's a horrible, like, I mean, there was one in particular where I was just, um, I was just in some practice and stuff, but doing interviews with a, a really cheap microphone that I'd bought, um, like was just kind of a mic that would sit on top of your camera. And, um, the audio that came out of it was terrible. Any sort of knock or bump to anything was picked up and it had like a horrible, uh, noise over the top of it and you ended up realizing like i really can't afford to be going cheap and, and my dad would say for years you know he'd always say to say like uh buying cheap is buying twice right because right. you you do or you always replace it if you buy cheap it, it was that was definitely a big hair puller moment for me to realize that but to be on set realizing that is just like terrible <laughs> to be sitting there going holy smokes i've got some really difficult work and more youtube tutorials to watch in order to figure out how i can <laughs> fix this so that yeah that's a definite hair puller absolutely that's that's such a tough balance right in in terms of uh, you do you go out there you do your best with all the research in the world there's the power of the internet today is so nice for that reason but it also gives you way too much choice right so uh, and then trying to balance that with your budget just duly difficult so why don't you you know bring your spirits up talk about the uh the good the best moment you've had so far uh best moment i've had so far uh, i would say um it kind of goes the same with um a lot of people when whenever you're working with them to create video is the best moments for me are those kind of reveals when um like earlier days when i was doing weddings and such if you went and showed the the footage with say the couple that were getting married um they would sit down and watch the footage like that you've all the, the full video that you've created for them and uh there'd be times when they're so happy or like so fond of all the memories they kind of made on that day, especially if, you know, if everything just kind of went right. Um, like there'd be times when like the couples might shed some tears and stuff at just how happy they are seeing it and be really thankful or all those messages you get back when you've kind of delivered the project, say via a link or something. And just seeing like the, the some of the feedback is, is really nice. If when people are really happy in terms of like not always necessarily having a full set plan they're not 100 percent sure what to expect in the final outcome it's it's always kind of really a really neat cool kind of moment when uh when someone's like giving you an all caps like wow this is amazing <laughs> like i love that that's kind yeah. of it's a nice moment because you know that um they feel like you really captivated like what they were trying to tell which is nice right. and 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 it kind of just means that you're doing everything that you've exactly set out to do so there's yeah. but some of my favorite moments is, is often is often in the feedback stage honestly that's very cool. And it, it gives you the opportunity to, you know, really get that payback for all those hours that you put into the work that um, those viewers, you know, will see that, say, six minute video or something like that, but not necessarily understand that um, Harry was grinding the last 50 hours in the editing room <laughs> working on that and, and, you know, putting your blood, sweat and tears into it. So that's, that's a really cool thing to, to really consider what that payback means to you. Yeah, big time. Yeah, no, people do because people don't realize that, right? They have no concept. But but once they've been with you, like, um, and as soon as someone's been with you on set each day, and and they see the work you're going into it, and sometimes even say, how how long is this going to put together? And you think like it's going to be at least forty hours, like for like a two or three minute video, it's going to be at least forty hours for me. And they're like, oh, wow. And then when you deliver it to them, and in, in like you know less than a week or something, so they know you've really hammered at it. Like it's, uh, um, yeah, it's pretty cool for that that kind of feedback and everything and, and just just the ongoing process of the whole project is is pretty cool right um what is one key piece of advice that you wish you had at the very start of perry films that you you think would be a benefit to share to people looking to get into entrepreneurship um i think a key piece of advice i, I mean for me like studying film for everybody is like um, that I would would have told myself back when I started would be don't buy cheap gear really to be honest like back to the hairball a moment yeah. don't buy cheap gear rent if you need to you can rent gear that's fine yes. there's loads of reputable companies you don't have to rent off just you know Joe Blow down the street that had, says he has a good mic you can rent off it like very reputable companies anywhere that will box it up ship it to you do whatever and it's not very much to rent so like I think 
yeah, that's probably a key piece of advice. Trying to think about the uh, the money I've probably spent on equipment that I've then replaced within less than a year is is pretty silly. So, yeah, yeah I would say don't buy cheap gear. <laughs> no, good good to know. And and you know, videography is not the only industry where you can rent equipment before buying it, right? So if um, if coming up with capital, for instance, is a barrier to your uh, entrepreneurial journey. Um, there's tons of places where you can rent uh, equipment for any industry, right? So even here locally in town, if you want to start your own uh, installation company or something like that, go rent a scissor lift. You don't necessarily have to buy that, right? Um, until you can justify it or, or afford it, right? Um, perfect. So let's go on to the next sort of area of uh, my curiosity with Perry Films here. Um, and one of the things I have to say I admire most about uh, Mr. Harry Perry is how he has done uh, his business completely outside of a nine to five job. Um, it's a very difficult thing to balance, um, but it is probably the most accessible way for people to um, start to explore entrepreneurship and operate their own business. Um, with that being said, there's so much workload that comes along with that. You know, not only do you have to balance uh, 40 plus hours a week at your regular job, family commitments, girlfriend, um, you know, kids, there's so many different things you have to balance and then also put time into your business as well. So I wanted to take this time to ask you what advice you had to aspiring entrepreneurs who may want to start their own business after hours. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really difficult to to try and balance everything properly in the sense of uh, um, getting everything from your work, the kind of what you might consider your side hustle or the business that you're building and also getting in personal time and health and everything like that. Um, probably one of the easier parts of it is just putting in time on both. The hardest part is really building in the social and personal and all that sort of stuff. Um, Cause all of that time, it obviously really adds up and it's important to have, uh, but that's kind of the part that's the first bit that you cut. Um, in terms of advice I'd give to people that were doing the same, um, biggest thing I think is like, the, like if you've got um, plenty of people around you, like loved ones, friends and everything, is really listen and look for cues as to when you think you might be going too far. Um, there's lots of information and you know various like kind of uh, um, social sort of media entrepreneurs or influencers that will tell you, you just gotta work more hours and harder than everybody else. and um, I did the same and went in with that concept, but realistically it's it's very difficult to do and it's it's very tricky at first because all the my whole time starting out, I was basically um, working, you know, probably at least like 14 to 16 hours a day at, at least. And most of the time you sat behind a computer screen. So then, um, you know, because you're doing everything from building your own website to whatever you're learning how to do that and then learning all the editing stuff you need to do and video and gear and all that. Um, but realistically then what's happening is you're not exercising as much as you should be doing you're in a very living a very sedentary lifestyle for the most part right like i i was ending up like gaining weight and everything so i think probably the key piece of advice is to um don't neglect kind of some of the the key important stuff um to focus on the kind of business and side hustle um in kind of the most kind of valuable uh, points and and try to get everything sort of pieced together bit by bit and and just use your time wisely i think there's a lots lots of time that can be wasted and and such otherwise but i mean don't don't be neglecting your health and everything like that at the same time because now i'm on the tail end of realizing that and i'm getting in slowly getting into better shape and eating better and exercising more and stuff and honestly my mood and efficiency and just how much production i can get done in the same time really hasn't changed from when i was like you know basically putting myself into an early grave just like never doing any of that stuff because i was right. just less productive less efficient in worse moods um whereas now I'm, I'm feeling a lot happier already and stuff so i think it's already put me in a better position and it keeps you in love with the the thing that you you're trying to build right so you don't want to fall out of love with it because you're working yourself too hard yeah i, I think a lot of people go through a bit of a, a cyclical relationship with it in terms of they're excited about this new thing um you know that they're working on and the prospect of potentially this being your nine to five one day, right? So they really put themselves into it. And as they start to neglect all those other areas in their life, uh, they actually get less productive, right? Because they're, they are, um, they're, they're more oh, angry is not the right word, but um, they're, they're just less happy with their happy with themselves because 
um, you know, you're, you're missing those friend connections. You're missing um, that really important you time or, or the time you spend with your partner that can really help recharge your batteries, right? So as I think every entrepreneur is going to struggle with this, right, at, at some point. But before you get into it, I think it's good to know what to try to avoid uh, before you get the ball rolling. And then, you know, you're able to mitigate that time a little bit. Uh, I feel like um, Harry and, and even myself and my own entrepreneurial experience have definitely had to learn that the hard way and try to shape up afterward rather than uh, going in knowing that that's maybe going going 100% into it 16 hours a day might not be the best best idea. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you do. I think sometimes it does take you to burn out before you realize. Um, and then for me also there was a there was a guy in town that was um, really big in a film like loved movies and various like like knew knew everything there is to know about film as well as like creating videos and such and would say to me like uh, have you watched like this movie or have you seen that? Oh, and you love the, I love the way that they do this and this one and stuff. And I'm sat there going like, man, I haven't seen any of these. And I'm like, I should really know a lot of this stuff or know the names of these directors or cinematographers and stuff. And I was sat there like, dude, I only know like a handful of these people <laughs> you're even mentioning. And then I was kind of, and I was kind of thinking, well, all of these have come out in like within the past year or more. Yep. And I was like, and here I am like sitting away in like what's more or less a bit of a dungeon, just, <laughs> just trying to work in a way. Cause I'm kind of like, you know, got to work hard, really like put in more hours than anybody kind of thing, which were right. Might be true to an extent, maybe in some, in some cases, but uh, yeah, I ended up realizing I was missing out on quite a few things. And then, so then therefore there were, there were things like in terms of my personal life, but there was lots you could take from your personal life that helped you in the entrepreneurial side, right? In terms of things you see or opportunities or, or news and stuff that's going on that could make an influence on what you do or strategies you have and all sorts of stuff. There's things that you miss out on, right? And, and techniques, especially in filming and that you kind of want to be keeping up to date and see new things that different people are doing and either studios or directors or even indie films and everything like that. You want to see what everybody's doing and keeping up to date with that. But when you kind of neglect that side of your life, you soon miss it, right? So there's lots, there's lots to be lost by, by doing that. Absolutely. By, by kind of just being shut in and, you know, working on your own work, you miss out on those, those ideas and those inspirations that can come from just everyday life. Right. So definitely uh, something to keep in mind is to just keep an open mind and try not to overexert yourself immediately into your entrepreneurial journey because exactly. you'll pay for it in the long run. Yeah, for as sure. excited as you are, you have to hold back. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, so another thing we talked about was building client portfolio from scratch. And, and that can be super difficult uh, for any service-based business that is starting out. So I know we talked a little bit about, um, you know, approaching, uh, approaching not-for-profits and, and working with businesses on a, on a free model. Um, but what advice do you have for entrepreneurs that want to get started but might, might not know how to connect with that first client? How do you, how do you approach and build that connection? Um, yeah, I think it, it goes back to me for the most part to the free to fee kind of concept. Um, but I think the, the big thing for me is in terms of approaching and being able to communicate with a client is, is really look into kind of what they're doing now. And I think that kind of goes into most industries. Um, it's very easy to research kind of what people are doing, even if it's kind of like a physical service, you can typically go by and see for the most part. Um, but really kind of making sure you kind of study the client a little bit and just check out what they're doing. Like in my case, I'd be really looking on what they're doing on social media. Like what kind of content are they using? Are they using any? Do they have stuff on their website? Is it from like a manufacturer or something? Or is it stuff they've made themselves? Um, is there good, reasonable kind of cause to think that um, they may be interested in that kind of thing? And and then kind of reaching out with that whole kind of free to fee model or, or whatever kind of strategy you've sort of used. And some people kind of lean towards advertising. Some people go to direct. Um, and lots of people are going to do a combination of both. But um, just really making sure that you're just maintaining professionalism and and the kind of the aspects that you give out about yourself. So like your website and socials and everything sort of falls more or less in line with what they would be looking for too. Um, you don't want to just like a really... Um, really intense website is as, as it can happen easily say in filming you could have a very intense imagery and you like some really unique or adventure action shots and stuff like that but then if you reach out to a retail store or something it's not really in line with probably what they're looking for so um yeah just making sure you stay relevant and and, and just be professional and uh, make sure you do your research for everybody that you're reaching out to and uh you know stick to your own strategies that's kind of what i think is the best cause of action for your first kind of uh, first early gigs. Absolutely. So, so you know, doing your research, making sure that you're going to fit that client need, um, and then obviously working with that sort of free model can be really helpful 
um, or even a cost model, right? If you're if you're working uh, in a really tight budget and you own a company who has a cost, right, to that basic um, providing that service or something like that, being able to do something at cost to build a portfolio is is still highly beneficial to that business as well. Yeah, hundred percent. And it, obviously, it goes into like you say, you can do it at cost. Like um, for me, when it when it can be just me doing it. You just, I'm just trying to do what I can to build the relationship first, then yeah. look at the, doing the finances and stuff after in terms of charging. Yeah, exactly the same thing. Go, go at cost, do whatever works for you in order to main, like build trust right out of the gate and, and get that relationship going. So let's think about uh, a fun hypothetical here. Um, you know, Perry Films is 10 years into the future um, and somehow a, a billionaire reaches out to you and says, Harry, you have an unlimited budget to make a documentary film on whatever you want. I don't know why this is happening, but congratulations to you. What would that documentary style film look like? Oh, um, for me, I like, in terms of one of my like biggest passions really is, would be something um, around Formula One racing. Um, if I was gonna make a documentary on that, um, that, that would be like a dream come true. If you could follow the crews and stuff everywhere, um, because they go all over the world telling the stories as they go. Um, for me as a documentary, that would be epic, like in terms of a, <laughs> uh, like a once in a lifetime kind of dream opportunity. Um, for any like for anybody that kind of knows me semi well, there's a, a, a huge Formula One fan. So I'm the guy that gets up at four or five a.m. on a Sunday and Saturday and to go watch the the qualifying or sprint race or the full race. And I'm like keeping up to date with all the news. Like my social media is flooded with just Formula One related <laughs> news. So that is 100 percent what I'd be trying to do. Absolutely. Now, if you know, unfortunately, that that was just a hypothetical. So you know, if that billionaire doesn't reach out for that documentary. Where would you like to see Perry Films ideally in about five years' time? Um, for Perry Films, I think ideally I'd like to see um, being quite kind of independent in the sense of um, having kind of a, a team of people to be able to um, utilize and connect with to get various productions done. Um, there's certain things you just, um, after so long, you can't always do on your own. There's too much things to set up, too many lights, too many like pieces of audio equipment, there's, you know, the cameras and lenses and everything. Um, it would be nice to be able to um, be in a good position to have people that weren't, you weren't always just relying on on like a one-time basis, you know, every so often in a month or something like that, and actually be able to have like an actual team that you can you can utilize for for that for each production in terms of like full time employees and such like that. Um, that would be a great position to be in um, within the in in a five years time. Um, yeah, it would be obviously it's nice to be, to think you've got your own offices and all sort of stuff, and it's dreaming big. Um, but yeah, that 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 would be a great place to be in order to be able to take on um, much bigger, you know. Um, full-fledged productions with a team of people or being able to adapt the team size to, to based on the project that would be a huge um a huge step i think in 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 kind of the, the kind of the story of that of prairie films harry i just wanted to thank you again for coming on today you've been a fantastic guest uh and i'll just get you to close out the show with one last piece of advice for any entrepreneur looking to start a business today uh for me uh, like one last piece of advice is going to be um, from my perspective to um, don't be afraid to network and reach out and connect with people even people that you might consider um, a competitor of yours um, which is might be considered a bit of a um, different take on things but f a lot of the time especially in any kind of creative industry um, you're not really competing with each other you're often building your own bases and and your own clients and oftentimes you have a lot to gain by connecting with each other even if you think you might um, be competing directly it's never a bad idea to be on good terms and on a good relationship don't be afraid to connect with people in the community you know potential people that you might consider a competitor or someone who's just in the same industry as you um, you have lots to gain and very little to lose honestly in my view by connecting and networking with people and just being a that friendly person that you see um, out and about and and yeah and just be very kind of inviting with everybody that you deal with that's honestly like probably the like key bit of wisdom I think I could leave you with.